Hello, audience. Welcome. My name is Walter Forsberg, and time.gov tells me that it is 6.01, and so I'd like to get tonight's event started. Thank you so much for joining us. I am the curator for audiovisual media at Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, working on a project called the Audiovisual Media Preservation Initiative, as many of you well know, having registered for this event. We're so glad that you did. And tonight, uh, we will be sharing some video clips from the amazing audiovisual collections at the Smithsonian, its 22 museum units and research centers, as well as meeting some of the people who comprise our task force on the AVMPI, which is a new pan-institutional initiative at the Smithsonian. We'll be hearing more from my boss, Alison Rupert Gerber about that initiative shortly. But um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping that I will read out of a script um, here. This session is being recorded to be made available later. And you'll notice that this Zoom is in webinar form. So don't worry about uh, having your camera or mic on. Um, we won't uh, inadvertently capture you. Um, but do feel free to use the chat feature in Zoom. If you have questions, uh, please use the Q and A um, feature in the Zoom webinar, and we will respond to all the Q and A at the end of the event um, with our various archivists, um, collections managers, media conservators. Closed captioning is available via the transcript, and you are welcome to turn that feature on if you so wish. At the end of the event, we'll have a survey if you'd like to fill that out, and you'll see me again moderating the Q&A. With that, I'd like to pass things over to Tammy Peters, uh, Associate Director at SLA. Tammy. Good evening. I'm Tammy Peters, as Walter said, Associate Director for Archives and Preservation. On behalf of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, I'm pleased to welcome you to our program today. AVMPI presents a Zoom with a view. First, we gratefully acknowledge the Native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, including the Nakachank, Anacostan, and Piscataway people. We also recognize the diverse and vibrant neighbor Native communities who make their home here today. The Smithsonian's Audiovisual Media Preservation Initiative, or AVMPI, was created in response to the needs outlined in two Smithsonian-wide surveys spearheaded by archive staff a 2016 audiovisual survey, and the 2019 audiovisual preservation readiness assessment. AVMPI is a partnership between the Smithsonian's National Collections Program and the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, and it will significantly move forward efforts to preserve and increase access to our audiovisual collections at the Smithsonian. AVMPI is off and running with three staff members who you will meet tonight, and will continue to grow in the near future. This initiative is more than just a library and archives program. It works to preserve and provide access to collections across the entire Smithsonian Institution. We're very proud of the work AVMPI has already accomplished and are excited to show it off here tonight. And we look forward to sharing more about this great initiative in the future. Now I'll pass it on to Allison. Welcome everyone. My name is Allison Ruppert Gerber, Preservation Coordinator and Head of AVMPI. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our inaugural program tonight, which will celebrate the diversity of our collections across the Smithsonian. The Audiovisual Media Preservation Initiative, or AVMPI, began as a small-ish survey and assessment of our audio, video, and film collections from 11 Smithsonian units. It has blossomed into a centralized resource for the cataloging, conservation, and digitization of our collections. Like Tammy said, AVMPI is currently supported by three team members with five more on their way who will work in preservation suites currently being outfit across the Smithsonian. These spaces will be supported by optimized workflows and streamlined equipment setups, all developed and implemented by the AVMPI team. When our 2019 audiovisual preservation readiness assessment revealed that a mere 13% of our audiovisual collections had been digitized for preservation, we knew that a strategic unified initiative was going to make the most effective impact on preservation. 
And while digitization remains our primary focus as the preservation method of choice for AV collections, our scope is much more far reaching. AV MPI is partnering with stakeholders across the Smithsonian to increase access through improved uh, collection search platforms, increase transcription and audio description, and a new website to host online exhibitions and resources. Because every recording saved is a story rediscovered. And with that, I introduce you to the Smithsonian's Audiovisual Media Preservation Initiative. Through home movies and scientific studies, through oral histories and folk music recordings. The Smithsonian's audiovisual collections reflect the diversity of our world. Unfortunately, we are at risk of losing this content forever. Due to their fragile nature and current resource limitations, more than 150,000 recordings could be gone by 2030. But we have a plan. The Smithsonian Libraries and Archives created the Audiovisual Media Preservation Initiative to catalog, digitize, and share our collections. The team is working alongside source communities, curators, and scholars to find new solutions for providing access to this vast body of content. Because every recording saved is a story rediscovered. Great. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Tammy. And thank you, Aaron, who is our behind the scenes projectionist tonight, um, streaming the videos. Uh, really appreciate you stepping in, Aaron, and doing that. How it's how things are going to unfurl tonight is that we will hear from four of seven of our task force members of the AV MPI. And um, our task force members are not necessarily dedicated staff to the initiative. Our task force members themselves have their own collections that they are stewards of, archivists for, conservators of, and um, they lend their time to guide and uh, advise on the project. And so we're gonna meet four of them tonight. The first of which is a dear friend of mine, Blake McDowell, who is the media archivist and conservator from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, Feel free to turn on your camera, Blake. We can see you. And Blake, you're going to share a little bit uh, from Stephanie Black's H2 Worker documentary. And I think it's a really great first taste of the kind of audiovisual collections that we have at the Smithsonian, spanning feature documentary award-winning films like um, Stephanie's film H2 Worker, but also different kinds of audiovisual collections that we'll, we'll see later on in the program. So without further ado, We'll hear from Blake and watch some, some video uh, for about seven minutes, and then uh, we'll return uh, for our next task force member introduction. Okay, thank you, Walter. Thank you for the kind introduction, and um, it's lovely to see the AVMPI uh, video there, and I'm really excited about this project overall. Um, as Walter said, I'm Blake McDowell. I'm the Media Archivist Conservator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And in that capacity, I lead our preservation activities for audiovisual media um, for the museum's collections. Um, yeah, the clips we are about to see come from the film H2 Worker. Uh, this film was acquired by the museum in 1990 as part of the Earl W. Stafford and Amanda Center, Earl W. and Amanda Stafford Center for African American Media Arts, aka CAMA. Dr. Rhea Combs, who is now the director of curatorial affairs at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Um, oversaw the acquisition and brought the film into the collection. Um, this film is a 1990 16 millimeter documentary film about the exploitation of uh, Jamaican guest workers in Florida's sugarcane industry. Um, the Jamaican workers traveled to Florida to work under the United States H2 visa program and hence the name of the film. Uh, it won at gr the Grand Jury Prize for Documentaries at Sundance in 1990. Um, 
We preserved this film from the negative A and B rolls at Photochem in Los Angeles and the audio from the quarter inch master mixes at Audio Mechanics in Los Angeles. Um, I got to work closely with the director, Stephanie Black, and the director of photography, Maurice Alberti, um, in doing this preservation. So it was a lot of fun because we often don't get to work with um, people who worked on the films uh, when we're doing this in the collections. Um, along with the film, the museum acquired the entire archive for the making of H2 Worker. And so this includes many hours of unused footage and audio created during the creation of the film, as well as letters from the workers back and forth to their families. And uh, myself and the rest of the media archives and conservation team are really looking forward to moving on to processing and making all of that also accessible um, to the public, um, which would be very much in line with the AVMPI spirit. So I'll end it there and uh, we can watch some film or some, yeah, scan film. <laughs> LAS 89.3 FM. A $10 million facelift is underway at the luxurious Wyndham Rose Hall Hotel in Montego Bay. And I've been trying from since about 1982 to get a card. And I never really get, the, the, I, re, I get one card, but I never really get the type that I want. I want an American card to go to cut the cane. So I'm not one of the lucky type. Message services telegram from Ministry of Labor to Anthony Brown. Notify farm worker program acceptance to Florida, USA. Report to 76 Hanover Street on Monday, October 20th at 9 a.m. for flight. Bring baggage, Jamaican ID, this telegram, and $80. Well, you go to the sugar cane because you want to get a little more money. I am an H2 worker Coming from the island of Jamaica I am an H2 worker Cutting cane in a Florida Working so hard in the burning sun Wondering if slavery really done I'm working, working Working on your cane feet still Working, working Working for your mega dollar bill I want to build a home. I want to build a house back home in Jamaica. And it's a struggle to do it back home. So I had to fight as hard as I can. Although it's not what I want, I got to proceed with it.
especially in the big sugar camps, they have their own commissaries. They don't want us to come in because their prices are very high. The guys don't want to buy from them, they want to buy from us because we're Jamaicans too and we know what they want. To get into some of the camps, we have to dress like men. I put my hair up, I dress up in pants and take my rings off, of course. And we sneak into the camp and make sure there are no cars coming, you know, and no police, no nothing. And we keep going on like that. Dear Anthony, compliments of this season to you. Everyone say hello. Your mother, your father, your sister, my brother. Did you enjoy the Christmas holidays? It was not happy without you in the home. There is something I wanted to tell you. There was a man who came to help Mr. Brown with his house. He was very nice. Sometimes he reminded me of you. The way he held his head high, the way it shook when he laughed. He's left now. Mr. Brown's house is finished. It feels such a long time since you left home. Please be good, your loving wife, Patricia. Great. Thank you so much, Blake. What a what a wonderful clip. What a wonderful documentary. And the topic of migrant labor and immigration is is very timely, it seems, always in the United States. Um, there are so many of us amongst uh, amongst uh, uh, native born Americans who are working in the United States. And so I really appreciate um, that clip. I see that some people have started to paste questions in the webinar chat. That's great. If you'd like to also use the, the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen, we can answer all of the questions um, at the end. And just to keep things moving here, um, I'd like to move on to uh, another task force member who it's my pleasure to introduce to you, the digital archivist. Lee Gilanella from the National Museum of American History Archive Center. Hi, Lee. You have one of the, the most thrilling, deep, and historical film collections, and I'm ever jealous of your job that you get to work with all of those just great um, motion picture films and audiovisual recordings. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe what you're going to share with us tonight? Sure. Thanks so much for the warm welcome, Walter, and as well as for the compliments on our film collections. So as Walter said, hi everyone. My name is Lee Jelanella and I am the digital archivist at the National Museum of American History or NMAH for short. I work in the NMAH Archive Center, which holds more than 1500 collections documenting the history of the United States with particular strengths in invention, innovation, technology, advertising, entertainment, and popular culture. Tonight, I have a video compilation for you, which features two films from the Archive Center's Alan Falcom Dumont collection. Before elaborating further on the collection, I wanted to just give a few shout outs to some awesome people. First to Blake, who you just heard from, who was responsible for facilitating the digitization of these films using equipment at his museum. Second to Annalisa Oding, the Archive Center's film contractor, for preparing the films and assisting with the digitization process. And finally, last but not least, I just wanted to give a shout out to APMPI for building these connections and encouraging us to work together on such a cool project. We would not have digitized these films without you. Now for some quick collection level background, Alan Balcom Dumont was an American engineer and inventor who revolutionized commercial television. He perfected the cathode ray tube, a technology that forms the basis of the modern television receiver. His company, Dumont Laboratories, manufactured the first commercial television set for use in homes in the late 1930s. Dumont would later go on to found the first television network to be licensed, which was eponymously named the Dumont Television Network. The films selected for tonight's event are kinescopes, meaning that they're recordings of television programs that were made on motion picture film before the widespread use of videotapes. The first film is a series of commercials for the Dumont Teleset. The second film, which is also actually a commercial for the Dumont Teleset, features an artist that many of you are familiar with but may never have seen on screen, Norman Rockwell. And with that, take it away.
you get a life-size window on the world in the Dumont Westwood. See the Westwood's big, steady, clear 203 square inch picture on the new Dumont 19 inch life-size tube. Listen to the rich toned FM radio and there's a plug-in for your record player too. See the Westwood at your nearest Dumont dealers. These people are enjoying lifelike pictures on their new Dumont teleset. Say, that's a good juggling act. Let's take a look. What do you think? Did she steal the show? Well, Dumont always steals the show with its clearer, brighter, lifelike pictures. The Dumont Fairfield gives you a life-size window on the world. 203 square inches of clear, steady picture on Dumont's new 19-inch life-size tube. Rich-toned FM radio and a plug-in for your record player. Get quality big screen television at a fantastically low price. See the Fairfield at your nearest Dumont dealer. Here's a happy pair looking at their new Dumont Teleset. Let's join them. Listen to the mockingbird, still singing beneath the weeping willow tree. Listen to the mockingbird, listen to the mockingbird. Whoever won that argument is okay with us. Because there is no argument when you say Dumont for lifelike television. Get a life-size window on the world with a Dumont Mansfield. Dumont's 19-inch life-size tube gives you 203 square inches of clear, steady picture, even in areas where ordinary receivers fail. The Mansfield has rich-tone FM radio and a plug-in for your record player. See the Mansfield at your nearest Dumont dealers. Well, here's a smart couple. They bought a new Dumont for those clear, lifelike pictures. This is something I'd like to see myself. Say, that's real magic. But for the wonderful magic of television, see Dumont's clear, lifelike picture. Everybody is talking about Dumont's newest table model, the Rumson. Its 12 and a half inch tube gives you 85 square inches of clear, steady picture, even in areas where ordinary receivers fail, with full, rich-toned FM radio and a plug-in for your record player. See the Rumson at your nearest Dumont dealers. What do you say, Maury? <laughs> Newton, no way. Ah. It's Maury Amsterdam. <laughs> Hey, Newton, whenever you go va 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 voom, you know that your mustache kind of twitches like that. What are you talking about? Sure it does. Everybody out there can see it. Don't be ridiculous. What do you mean, ridiculous? I'll get out there and show you. Go ahead. All right. You see, Newton, I told you, whenever you do this, it makes a twitching of the mustache mean a father to the people when they see it on the ground as they bite. <laughs> What'd he say? I'll tell you what he said. For that life-size window on the world, see Dumont. For a life-size window on the world, get the Dumont Bradford. 203 square inches of clear, steady picture with Dumont's newest 19-inch life-size tube. Complete FM radio, automatic record player, all in a distinguished cabinet of mahogany veneers. See the Bradford at your nearest Dumont dealers. <laughs> Let's take a moment for a quick trip to Vermont and visit the home of one of America's famous artists and beloved illustrators, Norman Rockwell. Back of his house is his studio, so we'll look in at Mr. Rockwell at his easel. Hi there, folks. Come on in, look around. As you probably know, I like to paint the typical American scene. Take this illustration, for example. It's a view of the gathering of the plane before the television set. And that's typical most everywhere you go these days. Look over here. The models, well, they're my neighbors, and that's my Dumont they're watching. I'm painting them from life, just as they come in here almost every evening. And I've painted myself into the picture, too. We really go television up here. 
And to get the most out of television, we do our viewing on a Dumont. Well, thank you so much, Lee. Oh, I love those TV commercials. Um, I think that in particular, the Norman Rockwell ad reveals so much about the importance of preserving audiovisual legacies, collections, and artifacts. An artist as, as large and larger than life, really, in the American imagination as Norman Rockwell, I would have never imagined that he sounded as he sounds and thanks to this tv commercial we can sound we can hear what norman rockwell and his voice sound like what his demeanor is like all thanks to um the recorded moving image um i think it also speaks to one of the the key uh themes in our project which is about preserving audiovisual history and the idea that technology and history of technology is imbricated within that. The idea that pre-videotape, so much time, expense, resources were put into television broadcasts that essentially were not recorded. Um, kinescopes, the filmic recording of TV broadcasts was an exceptional activity, usually reserved for um, programs that were high quality or uh, where a producer wanted to create a record. And so much of TV history is lost pre-1956 because we don't have any videotape recordings thereof. But um, without getting too deep into the weeds, I think I'll just keep things going here and uh, introduce our third presenter, who is a dear friend of mine and one of the, the first people to uh, help me preserve audiovisual collections at Smithsonian uh, way back in 2014, um, uh, allowing me to work on her film bench, for which I am forever indebted, uh, Kira Sobers, who's the digitization manager at SLA. Kira, please take it away. Thanks, Walter. Hi, everybody. As Walter said, my name is Kira Sobers, and I am the media digitization manager at the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, where we collect, preserve, and share the history of the Smithsonian Institution. Our collections contain over 60,000 pieces of audiovisual material that document Smithsonian staff, artifacts, events, exhibits, buildings, and research. Following on the technology theme, the clip I'm going to share with you today comes from our video history collection on mini and micro computers filmed in 1987. This is a set of interviews with an informal confederation of computer software designers known as the Brotherhood, and they're discussing the creation, marketing, and distribution of microcomputer software. This specific clip features Margot Comstock, founder of the software journal SoftTalk, giving a brief demo of the game Mystery House, which was written and designed by Roberta Williams, one of the co-founders of software company Sierra Online. Margot's demo is followed by Roberta talking about how she got into game development. And these interviews were originally recorded on beta cam tapes before being digitized. Enjoy. I remember I was selling ads at the beginning and uh, I had won that silly contest with the mystery ads. So when I called online, I said, gee, that name is familiar. And I got Ken. Okay, well, that's why it was then. You got the person who started it. And um, I said, you know, I think I, I think I played one of your games, this mystery house. I said, oh yeah, I won that contest. He goes, you won it? How could you do that? <laughs> you know, we expected that to take a long time. And I think that's why he bought ads, <laughs> the very first ads that he bought. How did the magazine. contest work? Um, how did it work? Well, it was, uh, do you want to, is, is this a good time to look at it? Sure, if you want sure. to. That's a good idea. That is the game That's that the game. you bought right. that Roberta had started and that Ken Pro uh, it was took it home and came up on the screen and there it was and what did you okay. do? Okay, well, it's, it, first of all, that game is significant because there had been a game that came from um, large computers uh, called Adventure and it's a logic game where you, where you have to type in your own commands that you think up. At that time it was only two words. and go through a whole no adventure words. yeah you have to go through a whole adventure and figure out what to do go into different rooms solve puzzles and things and this is a style of game and it had never been done with graphics and roberta invented this game and ken figured out how to do it at least i think that's how it worked um on the computer to put graphics with it and this was the very first time that that had ever been done was this game can you remember how the first to thing start you, it? The first thing you do is you go to the porch. You go steps. 
Try it. <laughs> How does it work? You've just bought it. It's come up on the screen. And there you are. This is a long time ago. Try it. Go steps. There we are. It says welcome. Let's try um, open door. Was that wrong, Roberta? <laughs> should open. There it goes. Okay. Just a little slow. Okay. <laughs> Go. Door. Oops. Door has been closed and locked. After me. Behind me. So I'm locked in. I see. Okay. <laughs> I'm now in this and all these people are here. You see, this is the entire... Well, yes. let's find out who they are. Look. People. The people were explained at the beginning of the game. Well, I guess we skipped that. Okay. Well, we can get this little piece of paper on the floor that so subtly says, note. <laughs> get note. Yeah, read the note. Okay, we've got it. It went away. So now we have to figure out that we must read note. Valuable jewels are hidden in this house. Finders keepers. It gives us an excuse not to feel guilty, but I didn't remember that. <laughs> how? That's how it works. That's how I how really write. How did you? Uh -huh. I wanted to ask Ken how he programmed Roberta's handwriting. Uh -huh. um, what we did is she had a uh, tablet that's. Um, had equivalent of a mouse in those days, although it was mechanical rather than uh, any kind of magnetic, electrical, anything. It was actually a mechanical tablet, and she traced into the computer each letter. So it was uh, it was actually her writing. So. Yeah, I, I had this. Um, it was like a tablet with a. Um, we call those. It was like a drafting. A drafting. Arm. Yeah, a drafting arm that I I moved around, so I just went like this. <laughs> and he wrote program that would take what I was doing with this graphics tablet and put it into the game. This was a commercial product that you had purchased for this? Yeah. Was the tablet. Mm -hmm. We purchased the tablet. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the first, the first graphics tablet graphics ever. The first tablet. It developed uh, in Simi Valley. It's called it? a Versa. Versa Rider. Versa Rider. Versa something who Versa developed Rider. it. And um, I don't know whatever happened to that. That was a good product for those days. What had been your experience, Roberta, with computers before you bought the, you and Ken bought the Apple in, was it 79? It was um, J January 1980. 1980, January mm -hmm. 1980. It was right after Christmas of 1979. My experience with computers was really pretty limited, and even to this day, I, I'm not a technical person at all. I, I don't feel comfortable with computers. I, I don't even know how to plug a computer in. I, you know, I, I don't know why I'm in this industry. <laughs> but, um, but my experience, I, I did learn how to program a little bit in COBOL. But what made you want to do this game? Well, were, I you, know uh, were you like Margo? A computer fiend? In, in, no, not computers so much. <laughs> it's just a game player. A game it, player? Mm -hmm. I don't even consider myself a game player. I, I'm, I'm, I must be very unusual. Because you know, people look at me and they say, "You don't look like a computer nerd, you know, or anything like that." I don't program, and I'm not technical, and um, and I'm not even a game player. Oh, what great modesty from Roberta Williams! Wonderful clip. Thanks, Kira. I think that the clip that that Kira shared of an oral history of Ken and Roberta Williams, the history of computer computing and computer history software development is really speaks to the importance of the oral history collections that Smithsonian units, museums, research centers have. Um, the Archives of American Art comes to mind, all of the hundreds and hundreds of hours of artist interviews and oral histories that that unit has. Um, the Civil Rights Oral History Project that the National Museum of African American History and Culture undertook and are available online um, are just examples of how we can work to preserve a public history um, from the people 
who lived it. And, uh, and one of definitely our priorities of, for digitization, preservation, and access uh, with the AVMPI project. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our fourth AVMPI task force member, who is the audiovisual archivist at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, which is a research center at Smithsonian, um, Dave Walker. Dave, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're going to share? Yeah, thank you, Walter. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Walker, and I serve as the audiovisual archivist at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. We're home to the Smithsonian's largest collection of audio and visual recordings spanning over 100 years of ethnographic and ethnomusicological documentation from all around the world. Not only do we have thousands of commercial albums from the 20th century, but we also have over 50 years worth of footage and recordings from our annual Smithsonian Folklife Festival. Unfortunately, a lot of the footage and recordings from this amazing event are on old, rapidly deteriorating physical media. One of our recent projects uh, that we worked on involved digitizing footage from the 2002 Silk Road Festival. The concept behind this program was to trace the cultural threads that exist between groups all along the historic Silk Road, from Venice to Japan. I'm excited to show you some of the clips from that festival, highlighting the diverse groups and peoples represented. I wanna give a big thank you to our colleagues, Dan Finn and Lindsay Bowler for all their hard work in transferring the footage from the original HD cam tapes. And to learn more about our next festival and more, check out our website at folklife.si.edu. And here we go.
Great. Thank you so much for sharing, Dave. Uh, I saw many people in the chat remembering having attended the, the Silk Road Folklife Festival back in 2002, bringing back some memories, those clips. Um, I would like to take a moment just to acknowledge, again, all of the, the hundreds of marvelous, hardworking, federal employees serving their country as collections managers, catalogers, curators, archivists, working with Smithsonian collections across, across our 22 museum units and research centers. And the AVMPI is really, really excited to, to support your work that you've already done. I want in, in that regard, I want to point people to the second link that Aaron has provided in the chat, um, I think at 609 timestamp. But if you click through to that spotlight online exhibition, you can see over 300 clips, um, moving image clips of already digitized material that those staff members across the institution have already done. And we're really excited um, over the next three and hopefully eight years to, to work with them to digitize hundreds of thousands more of these audiovisual collection items. To that end, I, I want to just mention and introduce by name our three task force members who are unable uh, because of time constraints to, to share material with you tonight, but will certainly be doing so in the future. And that those people are Mackenzie Beasley, Daisy Njoku, and Crystal Sanchez, who are all media archivists working at different uh, Sissonian units and uh, part of our task force. So, so thanks to them and all of their hard work. I also want to introduce um, people, last but not least, to my dear friend and colleague, um, who uh, is uh, an old uh, graduate school friend of mine, Siobhan Hagen. And it's just a, a dream to be able to, to work on this project uh, with you, Siobhan. So hi, how's it going? Thanks for, thanks for being on standby for projection. Thanks. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Aaron, for doing that. Um, and I'm just, I'm Siobhan. I'm so excited to be here. So excited uh, to be working on the AVMPI um, project. And it's pretty dreamy to be uh, working for the Smithsonian. <laughs> I've been a fan since I could walk pretty much. Um, so I, and I'm just becoming even more of a fan after I get, the more I get to know all my wonderful colleagues. And yeah, it's super dreamy to work with Walter. That's amazing getting the band back together. So, um, you know, I just, I'm really uh, thrilled and excited to discover, rediscover more stories and to share it with the world. And I look forward to um, chatting more with all my uh, colleagues about like the wonderful things that we find and sharing them with the public. Awesome. Thanks, Siobhan. Well, Siobhan, let's 
pass the torch to the audience who has already been pasting questions in the webinar chat. I see my mother has just congratulated me. Thank you, mom. Um, but some other members of the public have pasted some questions also in the Q&A. Uh, um, I guess we can just go in order. Um, I don't know, Aaron, how, how you would propose that, that we do this if you have a preference, but maybe all of our presenters could turn on their cameras and be at the ready to to go hot mic. Um, I know Blake wanted to answer Julia's question. What is the purpose of the Smithsonian? Blake, did you have a, a thought or a personal reflection on such a uh, such a philosophical existential question? If not, you can defer to me. Oh, give us give us your hot mic. My apologies. Um... I think the standard answer is the increase in diffusion of knowledge, but I will pass that to you, Walter, since um, I think you're well positioned to answer that one. I think that that's the the most succinct and accurate response. I one of the things that I've been thinking about lately, um, because my job is curator, and uh, one of my primary roles is to help our team prioritize which material we preserve, digitize first, and trying to think about the history of audiovisual collections at the Smithsonian. It's a very fascinating um, and historical question. And one of the things that it brought me to is to really realize and respect how each of our secretaries has defined how we increase and diffuse knowledge. Um, historically, some of those secretaries have emphasized research. Uh, others have emphasized exhibitions. And I really think that it's an exciting opportunity for those of us on the task force and those of us who are staff within the AVMPI um, to craft our own vision of how we make these collections accessible to the public and researchers. So um, I'll just keep going down the line here. Uh, Anonymous, you're asking, how do you prioritize which AVMPI collections to digitize first, especially if accessions are still being added to current collections? It's a great question. And it is a question, um, <laughs> I don't wanna do all the talking, but uh, this is part of my job. Um, so I will just quickly say that it's a very complex um, mathematics that we employ and are still really developing. When we inventoried effectively collections uh, across eight and then 11 of the museum units and research centers um, in the mid and late two, uh, 2010s, um, we discovered that there were approaching 300,000 collection items. And how we prioritize those has a lot to do with um, traditional conservation prioritization factors like uh, decomposition, degradation, deterioration of a physical carrier, um, also format obsolescence, certainly, especially with regard to like magnetic tape formats, um, like the older videotape formats and some audio tape formats, the sheer fact that the players that render the signal encoded on that magnetic tape are no longer made and are very hard to find extant working um, machines of really help guide some of our preservation priorities. Um, and there are definitely lists of at-risk formats. And so that informs, informs our priorities, but also obviously content and uh, what's happening in the world and uh, our own personal research interests are going to be things that that guide us. And so finding a balance of that is is really part of the exciting challenge of the project. And I hope tonight you see the wide, some of the wide spectrum that the collections have. Sorry, that got long. Um, Kirby, who already the best AI for archives today? I am, don't know. Um, and archives continue to be retained in their original form, physical, but also born digital, certainly, yes as well as being digitalized, how might this dual archiving be maintained within the Smithsonian? And then uh, does volume storage space matter? Certainly uh, the digitized result of our um, digitization efforts of analog collections is a giant task and that falls to the office of the chief information officer. Um, 
maybe Allison, do you have any thoughts uh, about OCIO or any of the other collections managers? One one of the one of the early questions, because we've only been working, uh, you know, on staff for less than six months here, was how much uh, storage space should we initially request? Siobhan, do you remember how much we ended up uh, receiving? Well, that was it was sort of per year, I believe we were looking at. Um, was it fifty terabytes? Yeah, so 50 terabytes. Um, but again, our DAMS is uh, a repo digital repository that uh, is centralized. It receives all of the digitized assets from conservation digitization work across the SI. Um, and I, I that would be for Crystal, our other task force member who's not here. Um, I can't I can't tell you how many terabytes, but it's certainly in the uh, tens of petabytes. I was, if you want, if you wouldn't mind, I was just going to answer, uh, add on to that answer in terms of like, does storage space matter? Um, and does it matter retaining both? And I think, yes, retaining the physical carrier is also equally as important in certain situations. Um, and I think that this comes back to the idea of prioritization as well. Um, one of the things that we are looking at is at AVMPI is generational content uh, and trying to be very strategic about what we are digitizing and why we're digitizing it. So if something exists in its original form on film and we have that film, but it has been transferred over time onto a video format, uh, maybe the audio has been transferred to poor quality audio format. We're really trying to digitize the best copy that we can rather than just digitize everything, which would increase um, our storage needs. And so, um, yes, it's a very complicated mathematical situation, as Walter has alluded to, but we're really trying to make the best decisions we can to reduce our impact on digital storage. Um, I also think the concepts of deaccessioning collections is something that we would also like to tackle as we begin digitizing collections um, and just making smart decisions about what we're retaining as far as the physical nature of the collections go. Great, great answer. I don't, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in or just directly address any of the, the Q&A, but um feel free. One that I think maybe we could uh, pass the hat and go around uh, around the room popcorning to each other about is um, maybe a little bit about career path and how each of our uh, task force member collection managers got involved in this kind of work. Tony is asking. Um, I think that's a that's always a great question that the universe of museums archives was so mysterious to me until I started asking people how how they kind of fell into it as many have well i'll start I'm, i get oh no kira please don't i i, I want to speak less i'm happy to start as i feel like i probably have the one of the least conventional paths of those of us on the task force um i and there's another question in there about experience um i actually started at the smithsonian as an intern in grad school, just getting a master's in American history, um, no AV background or anything. And I happened to be there at sort of the right time when we were starting to just dip our toes into the water of AV preservation ourselves within the archives and um, did a lot of research on like optimal preservation file formats for it that then when a contract position opened up since it was brand new equipment we were using that nobody knew how to use anyway uh, because I already had the technical knowledge of like the preservation file formats um, I became the person that was selected to learn how to use this new equipment um, and then as my former um, boss and great colleague likes to say I just never left um, I stayed until I just kept staying and learning more and stuff about the world of AV preservation until I've gotten to the position that I'm in now. And so as far as like what kind of degree and stuff you need, people will tell you all kinds of different things and you'll hear from the rest of the task force members, their stories, but I've found that there is no one right path and it's kind of what path works best for you.
Anyone else? I will just mention that I fell into audiovisual archiving through working in film production. So that was kind of my cheminement professionnel. But um, uh, anyone else have any thoughts or want to share, well, Dave? Well, like like Walter, uh, I, I came from production as well, even though I showed some video clips. My background is in um, working with audio. Uh, and so I was going to school and really becoming, um, you know, engaged in the practice of studio audio recording to tape um, in a city where there were still a handful of studios that were recording directly to tape. And so it was a great opportunity to, um, you know, work with the machines, work with, um, you know, experts in the field that can maintain this equipment and keep it alive and have these secret short lists of where to get certain parts, that sort of stuff. And so, you know, after about a decade, you know, of, of mixture, you know, working in production and education, I found myself kind of in the field of, of archiving because I really um, fell in love with, you know, working with uh, pre-recorded content, especially stuff that, you know, might be several generations um, ago, you know, um, it's, it's a window into different times. Uh, and so for, for me, it's, it's a really satisfying um, thing. And I think a lot of my colleagues share the same feelings. I can go as well to share a little bit about my background. So I am an archivist. I came into the field through an interest in special collections librarianship. And over time, that shifted into an interest in digital preservation and working with digital content more broadly. So my background is not in AV at all. And actually, when I was in grad school, I never even took a course in AV preservation because I assumed I would never need to know anything about AV. Um, I did end up working on a project, though, while I was in grad school that involved working with a, pro a professor on his research project involving the Music Time in Africa radio program. So that gave me a little bit of knowledge about AV from that, which did it pique my interest, but I didn't think I would revisit that topic and at all in the future. But flash forward to now, I, as I work in the digital archivist at the Museum of American History, I have seen firsthand that there is just such commonalities in what I do as a digital archivist and what is done on the AV preservation side of things. Because when you digitize AV, then you have a new digital asset that needs to be preserved and taken care of. So over time, while I started out as a pure digital archivist, I've shifted into a role where I work with both digital content and also AV as well. It's been a ton of fun to learn. I'd love to um, just jump in real quick because I know we only have two minutes, but uh, I also have a similar background uh, as Walter where I came in through film and video production, um, but I was not a technical person. I really just wanted to uh, tell stories um, and the stories of, of um, audiovisual archiving is what kind of drew me into the profession. And then I learned that I can be technical and that it's not um, something that is, it's for everyone, preservation is for everyone. Um, and uh, even if it seems um, like impossible to overcome, um, much like <laughs> digitizing all of the Smithsonian collections, audiovisual collections, like together um and if we share our knowledge uh, and our strengths then you can totally do it as well so well great i i will mention that i know a lot of people are interested in the field and professional advice maybe um how can you learn more how can you volunteer i'll just mention that we have a resource email account if you want to get in touch and ask more in-depth questions directly about this topic it's avmpi at si.edu. Um, and we will start checking that resource account, which was created a couple of weeks ago, um, to answer some of those questions. I did want to get a couple more. Aaron, are, are we allowed to call extra time, like in the World Cup, if it's a tie game kind of thing? I'm, I'm just going to make that call. He says, or... sure, in the chat. Oh, OK. Um, I see that John has asked many questions, um, so let me just try and crank a couple out. John asks, how many AV formats do you have in your collections? And I'm, I'm opening up uh, a spreadsheet that lists uh, all of our unit totals by format that we've inventoried. I can answer and that, I, Walter. It's 54. Ah, okay. 54. Thank you, Kara. I've had to report on that stat enough times. Um, John also asks, uh, what 
preservation means, maybe more existentially, and whether we merely convert to a digital format or if we take steps to restore and preserve the original. And yes, I would say it depends. Maybe we can all share our thoughts about this. Um, um, but we certainly do conservation of an original physical analog element. Um, a great example would be like a motion picture film, like those Dumont um, kinescopes. That's a human readable uh, format. And while those may have been transferred to a standard definition videotape format like VHS, say, in the 1980s, we can go back now with contemporary technology and rescan the film at 4K resolution, 8K resolution. So it's always really important in our field to preserve that original carrier, um, even if it becomes maybe unreadable um, for a time. Um, there may be technology in the future that enables us to to read that. Um, there's something called Irene that helps us read uh, shattered uh, uh, recorded sound groove discs. But um, about creating uh, new elements, maybe Blake, when you when you did the digital restoration, I presume of H2, did you um, H2 worker, did you create a new film negative that could live on, or did you just do a digital restoration of that? Um, for this one, we actually did just do a digital restoration. We may do one down the line, but we had um, a 35 millimeter blow up, um, which was in really, really good shape. Uh, so I decided not to spend the money on it right now. But for many other projects, yes, a uh, creating a new negative and new optical soundtrack negative so that you can go on to create further prints is our um, general path forward. And Allison, maybe you can just talk a little bit about the the long term storage of those those original carriers. Um, how how temperature, humidity control kind of factor into it into their longevity? Yeah, I mean each format sort of has its own ideal requirements for temperature and humidity. Um, we can't really make a a blanket statement about freeze everything, um, particularly with magnetic media. And so, um, yes, I think getting these things into specialized environments, particularly things that aren't deteriorating at quite a rapid rate as others is incredibly important, um, for long term. uh, but how we go about that and how we build out those storage facilities is, um, it's a whole nother uh, problem that we have to tackle, but yes, environment is always important to consider for long-term preservation. I see that, um, and feel free, I know I'm I'm uh, chattering away here, task force members, but feel free to, to chime in. Um, I see Ryan is asking a question. Have you encountered situations where the descriptions of the AV content does not quite match up? with the content when it is digitized. Uh, this alone, Ryan, is why you should join our field. It is so exciting. Um, as Allison mentioned, uh, every recording save is a story we discovered. And a lot of times we don't even have a description of what something is. It might just be a tape in a case. It might just have a label with a cryptic uh, description on it that we don't know what it is. and unearthing or surfacing or giving voice to or whatever uh, verb you want to use for rediscovering this material um, is really one of the most exciting aspects of the job for me at least and I will say that I've witnessed time and time again that the preservation of a work or the rediscovery of a work maybe it's by a filmmaker or an artist oftentimes gives an audience for that work um, that is much, much larger than when the work was originally created or diffused. And so it's really um, an exciting aspect of the job. Do I don't know if people have other like, uh, we just found this cool thing um, buried in a box stories, but just last week, Siobhan and I were speaking with one of the museums that um, told us there was something that wasn't on the inventory that got us very, very excited about um, documentation of what was called the Inca Highway from the 19, uh, early 1950s, a giant uh, 600 item film collection. Um, so that's something that-, that Original production into. elements, right? From the camera person, yeah. 
I think for me, it's been the most exciting things have been less about like what wasn't on the table label and more about the table labels being very incredibly vague and having no concept of what the content might be. Um, we recently digitized a set of audio tapes that were simply titled UFO Symposium um, from the 1980s, I think. And that was a fascinating listen. Um, and again, like the, none of our stuff, none of the archives collections are digitized or are cataloged in detail at the item level. It's usually just whatever title is on the tape. Um, and so you never know what those titles mean. <laughs> And I'll add that, you know, one of the advantages of digitizing now, you know, at a time when uh, we're all connected or we can increasingly start connecting with one another um, is a lot of times there will be collections with these descriptive um, terminologies for groups and people and languages, um, many of which are very outdated. So uh, now uh, as we digitize and, and begin to preserve um, these items with very limited metadata, um, we can start reaching out to the communities that are represented um, on the recordings and sharing back with, um, you know, even the individuals or the descendants of the individuals who are, you know, shown in a film or playing fiddle, you know, on a recording. So it's, it's, it's really, um, it, it's a great way to, you know, connect the, what we have in the collections with, um, you know, those represented. Mm -hmm. it, it's a lot of fun to, um, speaking specifically of uh, visual um, stuff when you don't know what it is to kind of be like, oh, I see, I see a sign in the background. Oh, it says uh, Steve's Hardware Store. Hmm, let me see, where, where was there a Steve's Hardware Store? Oh, th there's a street sign. Steve's Hardware Store is at the corner of Lime Street. And so you can just sort of go down this. And next thing you know, you, you realize that, you know, you know where this was, what year it was shot. And so it can be really fun and you can get kind of obsessed about it and then spend hours doing it. Well, I, I, think, uh, I think we've run out of time. Um, and I really want to thank all of our presenters tonight. Uh, it was very generous of you to, to spend time tonight after hours uh, with us. And also to Aaron for facilitating um, the entire uh, event. Uh, my colleagues on the AVMPI project and Tammy uh, and all of our audience uh, for asking such awesome questions. Again, if you have uh, any deeper burning questions that you want to ask us, uh, feel free to reach out um, through our email resource account, avmpi at si.edu. And uh, you can also check in the chat uh, for a link to those hundreds of already digitized audiovisual clips. Um, and with that, Allison, have I forgotten anything that you can think of? No, I think that this was an excellent program and I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Okay, thank you all. And uh, we will make this recording available on the SLA's YouTube page in the future. Thank you.